Hi, everyone. This is Liz Tran from Quasi. Just wanted to welcome you to Quasi's Spring 2017 Cyber Seminar Series. Uh, it is on heterogeneity, complexity, and anomalous transport in hyd hydraulic systems. Just a few things to note. Um, we will have a Q&A session after Antoine's uh, presentation. Uh, when you, if you have any questions, please do not use the questions panel. Please type your questions into the chat box so that we can read it out loud and that Ant Antoine can see it as well. Um, so take it away, Diogo. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming to the second of our seminar series on anomalous transport. Last week, we had a great introduction and overview from Rena Schumer. This week, uh, Antoine Obono from Purdue University is going to get a little bit more into the specifics um, at uh, looking at linking freshwater transport and quality, a, a new frontier. Antoine, the floor is yours. Thanks, Diego. Well, uh, welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for uh, coming to the seminar, to the online seminar. Uh, thanks uh, for the organizers as well uh, for having me. So, yeah, so I, I titled my talk, Linking Freshwater Transport and Quality, Is It a New uh, Frontier? Uh, and I'm, I'll be trying to, you know, tie my talk into the, the series uh, topic of heterogeneity, complexity, and anomalous transport in hydrologic systems. Uh, and a lot of my work, you know, revolves around understanding anomalous transport. So Dr. Schumer last week uh, gave that great introduction on more of the uh, theory behind it and where it all comes from. And my approach today will be to present more experimental work. So, um, you know, how does that influence uh, transport uh, in real system? Or how does that look like? And this first slide is just an illustration also uh, tying, you know, the uh, heterogeneity and complexity uh, that we can see on the right side here of that, you know, kind of typical river with uh, a lot of uh, complexity in it and then obviously an agricultural uh, ditch at the top which, um, you know, human society tends to simplify and, and reverse that uh, complexity. Uh, so that's, that's just a, a little illustration to tie in uh, the topic. So I'll, I'll, I'll oops, if I could... Uh, Actually, yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> so this first slide is just uh, introducing. So one of the things uh, that is a grand challenge, according to the National Academy of Engineering, is to provide access uh, to clean water, right? And uh, there's some some something of a, a contradiction here because you know water when it falls from the sky is pretty clean traditionally. It's distilled water. Uh, but of course, again, uh, mostly because of human activities, uh, there's a lot of uh, pollution or uh, degradation of this uh, quality. And again, this is a, a very simple illustration of, let's say, uh, transporting the environment where, you know, up in the mountains somewhere we have some clean fresh water. And then, of course, there's uh, either agricultural activities or you can replace uh, the agriculture by cities and uh, wastewater treatment plants. Uh, Etc. So there's activities on the landscape that uh, pollute this water, and then we end up with regional uh, to global scale uh, environmental issues. And again, this illustration is simply uh, if we put a lot of fertilizer uh, on the land, it ends up in the riverways. Uh, and then, of course, there's those algal blooms that you can see in those pictures uh, that result in you know uh, large areas of uh, what we call hypoxia, where you know the, eventually the algal bloom dies and then the oxygen disappears and that creates uh, huge environmental problems and death. Um, so this is kind of the traditional view uh, of you know, human activities polluting the water, uh, but um, you know, there's a new, new concept out there uh, of actually seeing this uh, quote-unquote pollution as a resource, right? So now the water is loaded with, let's say, fertilizers uh, so, but this fertilizer is also an opportunity if we could recover it. Uh, so a lot of new treatment systems, so here's an illustration of a company uh, working with the Chicago treatment plants, which is the world's uh, largest treatment plant, to recover the phosphate uh, out of the uh, uh, stream uh, in order to uh, resell it and, and you know, uh, do a business of it. And another example uh, that people are probably more familiar with is uh, simply uh, growing algal biomass, for example, or using biomass for biofuel. So again, if we have you know fertilized water, we could potentially use it uh, to grow uh, basically other biomass, and this way we have 
not only clean water at the end of the process, but also a, another resource, which in this case would be the biomass. Uh, so again, a shift from you know just water pollution to also you know a new resource that we could that is untapped, pretty much. Um, and of course, going back to uh, to the rivers and streams, uh, probably everybody's seen that uh, illustration. The ceci n'est pas une pipe. The, this is not a pipe by Magritte. And I, I should say, I stole this idea from my uh, former advisor, Dr. Pacman at uh, Northwestern. He used that in a couple talks, and uh, I kept using it since. Um, and so streams are not pipes, right? They're not just simple uh, tubes throwing water downstream, but they're complex uh, bioactive granular filters. They're literally the water goes in and around those sediments, and there's tons of biology that is illustrated here by by the uh, moss growing and the algae at the bottom, etc. So there's a lot of um, biogeochemical activity in the water. So there's basically a purif natural purification system uh, in natural streams, and that's basically what we use also in our uh, technologies in, in, in treatment plants usually. Um, so a lot of the, you know, there's a lot of potential basically during transport uh, for remediating uh, water quality, but there's only so much uh, that the environment can do. So, excuse me. I'm <clears throat> so the thing that I'm really interested in is uh, hyperic exchange. So this is kind of my sandbox. So I'm interested in general in anomalous transport and transport uh, in systems in general. But my sandbox or where I'm uh, studying those uh, phenomena typically is around the hyperic zone. And this is an illustration to sort of define what that is, right? So um, there's many definitions, but the the uh, the best I can think of is really the zone that is inundated by water that originates and returns to the surface water. So it's basically if there's water in a river or in a stream that enters the ground, enters the subsurface, and then returns uh, sometime later uh, to the stream. Uh, and again, you can see here an illustration of the multi-scale uh, or multiple scales of exchange between you know the larger meanders uh, to the sidebars and and larger uh, features in the stream all the way down to the tiny little uh, ripples and dunes and even grain size uh, if we want to go there. So there's a, a multi multitude of scales basically that create um, this exchange of water, uh, literally pumps water from the stream into the ground and then back out. Uh, and then of course uh, that's also, um, so where that water enters and leaves uh, the substrate uh, is also where most of the uh, biology exists, right? So again, in, in typical streams and rivers, that's not true everywhere, but uh, mainly we'll find biofilms at the bottom of the river uh, and then into the sediments. And of course, those things, um, you know, the filtering of the water is essentially uh, where this water is exchanged, so at this interface, uh, and also where the water is slower, because of course, velocities in the, um, in the substrate, in the porous media, uh, are much, much, much slower than in the river. So we have those multiple scales of exchange and also multiple scales of travel times or, or velocities. And as uh, Rina explained last week, uh, that creates then patterns of transport that are uh, anomalous, so-called anomalous, <laughs> uh, or you know that don't conform to our traditional advection dispersion models. Um, so today specifically, this I, I would like to talk about uh, mainly two projects, and again, these, these are both uh, exper mostly experimental um, uh, projects. So the first one will, uh, in the first one, we we'll look at the fractal bed forms and the residence time in the subsurface. So we we'll look at bed topography and how, again, this influences uh, both the scaling of residence times, and uh, and we we'll look at uh, new ideas on also the influence of the scaling on. Uh, biogeochemical reactions or uh, uptake rates of uh, nutrients. Um, and then the second project I'll talk about in the second part um, concerns biofilm growth and residence time. So in, in that second project, uh, we look at um, experimental streams. So it's a facility at Notre Dame, actually, uh, that has um, different uh, outdoors uh, streams or, you know, large flumes or small streams and we grew uh, biofilm over time during a growing season uh, in those streams and then we looked at uh, transport patterns uh, as biofilm grew. So we look at biofilms more as a, a structure basically that uh, modifies the conservative transport. 
And then finally, I wrap up with a few other projects, just kind of a, giving an idea of more breadth of uh, some of the work I'm currently doing. Uh, so that will be uh, towards the end. Okay, so jumping into that uh, first project, and this is a mouthful of a, a title slide, uh, space-time fractal filtering in rivers linking the fractal patterns in riverbed morphology to the fractal scaling of water storage times and water quality. Uh, and again, so the, the main reason, so I, I like this illustration uh, because you can clearly see the dye, so this, this pink, uh, uh, this, this pink, pink spots are rhodamine, uh, eluding from a uh, sand bed, so this is a top view of a sand bed where you can clearly see the uh, small bed forms, um, and then you, you can really see the, the, the correlation, I would say, between where the dye is coming off from the bed uh, and, the, the, um, and the, re the relief, basically, and the, the crest of those bed forms. So this is kind of a nice illustration of how the exchange of water between the bed and the surface uh, works. Um, so I'll go back to that um, to that picture a little later, uh, but I'd like to introduce first um, uh, the notions behind this uh, this work. Uh, and the, the first thing is, you know, we always talk about uh, fractals. So fractals are um, patterns that are um, basically self-similar. So when we look at different scale, we observe similar. Um, uh, patterns, basically. Um, but again, before fractals were uh, invented, uh, people already used sort of uh, scaling laws. Um, and this is, you know, a, a classic uh, paper with the Leopold relationship, Leopold and Maida, uh, USGS actually report rather than a paper, uh, where we can see the scaling of uh, velocity, depth, and width uh, with discharge and that Paolo scaling. So again, Rina talked a lot about Paolo's lab last week, and this is a little bit, you know, this is the bread and butter of uh, anomalous transport, but Paolo's, you know, Paolo scaling was already, um, um, you know, discovered um, many, many years ago. <laughs> um, so this is in the late 50s, I believe, uh, the Leopold uh, report. Uh, and again, you know, through time then, uh, people starting, started to pay more attention uh, to fractals and formalize the math behind it and everything. And again, on the left side here, you have the classic Malbro uh, book, uh, Fractals Form uh, <coughs> Chance and Dimension. And, and so Mandelbro is the first one recoining the term fractal for those objects that look similar at different scales. Uh, and then, so Mandelbro himself actually used geophysical examples uh, in his papers and in his uh, research, but he worked essentially on, on the mathematics behind it. And then, you know, later during the late 80s and 90s, uh, so you have a Turkoti book here, Fractals and, Cha uh, and Chaos in Geology and Geophysics. I believe the edition is 1992, so early 90s. And then on the right side, probably many of you have seen uh, that book. Um, this is the uh, Fractal River Basins by uh, Rodriguez de Turbe uh, and Rinaldo. Um, and, and again, this is kind of applying uh, fractal math or thinking of uh, river basins as fractal objects, basically, and a lot of work was done uh, during the 90s on, on, on these topics. Um, and now again, focusing even more, you know, I'm going towards my little sandbox here. Uh, so we went from the math to the, you know, earth, basically earth sciences, to the river basins, and now this is an, an illustration of a paper by uh, Doug General Mark Mack out of his uh, PhD work, I believe, back then, uh, where he looked at bed forms, so within the, the river, looking at the topography of the uh, river bed, and then again, uh, on the right side is just an illustration, but you can see that log-log uh, plot of uh, with a clean um, Paolo uh, scaling regime and then a saturation to the right, but again, showing that uh, basically bed forms in rivers are uh, fractal objects like our uh, most uh, geophysical objects. Um, and then so this is kind of the um, physical environment of uh, the, the riverbed and, and how the morphology of it is uh, a fractal or exhibits fractal patterns. Uh, now that relates to the resonance time. So I'm getting more into, uh, you know, relating to what uh, Rina talked about. Actually, she talked about that 
uh, very paper last week, I believe, the Haggerty paper. Uh, and this is one of the uh, original papers that really showed uh, the Paolo uh, residence times in uh, rivers. So again, what we're looking at is concentration on the y-axis versus time on the x-axis, right? So basically, this is a traditional solid injection in a river where we literally dump a bunch of salt, typically, or some dye or something that we can trace at some place, and then we go downstream somewhere and measure it over time, right? So this is what we're looking at. This is that measurement of that plume going by, uh, you know, through time. And again, uh, notice the uh, log log uh, scaling here of the concentration end time, so that straight line on that plot is a Paolo tail, like it says here, with a slope of 1.3, or minus 1.3. And again, traditional, more traditional uh, models have used uh, exponential residence time distribution to model those tails, or even uh, no transient storage, basically, like just the advection dispersion equation, which is even more truncated. So th th that was really a, uh, a clear demonstration that transport in streams typically is uh, uh, anomalous or exhibits, you know, Paolo tails. Uh, and then the question is, okay, can we relate uh, the fractal patterns of the morphology uh, with basically the fractal uh, scaling in time that we observe in streams and rivers? And that's really where uh, this whole idea uh, of doing those experiments uh, started. And so I'm finally getting to what we did, and this is all published in GRL uh, in 2015, so a couple years back now. Uh, but um, what we did to test these ideas uh, was simply to use a flume. So you have an illustration on the left side here of a flume, and we have similar flumes here at Purdue. Uh, in that case, we actually went to uh, Saffle in Minnesota, and the flume was actually larger than this one. Uh, but we basically made bed forms with uh, sand and flow. So we filled the flume or filled the flume. We made a sand bed in a the flume, then we turned on uh, the water right, to make the bed form form naturally, so the water was shaping those bed forms as, as it pleased, and then we um, injected, so basically what we did, we stopped the flow once we had the bed form, uh, stopped the flow, drained the flume, scanned uh, the topography, so we scanned the whole entire uh, topography to get uh, good um, topographic data, like millimeter, millimeter scale uh, pixel, uh, and then we filled the flume back up with rhodamine in it, so with that pink dye, uh, in the water so that the entire bed was completely uh, logged or completely full of rhodamine and then we measured it measured it over time uh, basically overnight so we let it go all night uh, and then we had about 15 hours of uh, data and we had two different cases as you'll see here so I'm showing now the uh, the main results uh, from uh, from these experiments so we had two different uh, patterns that we test so the what we call small and large topography and again it should be obvious from the data or from the um, plot here on the bottom left. Uh, so this bed topography is literally the, uh, it's an eight meter section of the flume and you can clearly see just by the pattern that on the top we have smaller scale topography and on the bottom we have those larger uh, dunes uh, uh, forming. So we use two different uh, discharges to, to make those patterns. Uh, and again, you know, that relates nicely or that ties nicely, hopefully visually, uh, to that complexity uh, story that this seminar series is about because you can clearly see that even though they, it looks like there's uh, uh, a major scaling uh, or a major scale of interest, when we actually uh, look at the, um, the data, so on the top right here, you can see the, uh, you can see the uh, power spectrum uh, that is calculated from those uh, topography. Um, so the power spectrum clearly uh, shows a scaling regime, what I call a scaling regime here in the middle. So again, the power spectrum for those of you not familiar maybe uh, with what those are. So basically you can think of them as uh, inverted. Uh, the x-axis is inverted. So on the left side here, uh, those flat lines, what, what's called white noise on the, um, on the slide, um, this this is the largest uh, features, right? So that's where we get to uh, the size of maybe not the, the whole flume, but a, a large size, basically. So at that point, there's no correlation, basically, in the elevation, in different elevations. So everything is what we call white noise or random. Uh, but again, in the middle, you have that, what I call the scaling regime, where the two 
uh, bed forms, so, so the large and the small topography seem to exhibit uh, quite different uh, scalings. Uh, and then finally, towards the end, so in the smaller, um, at the smaller scale, so where we tend towards the grain scale almost, uh, we have a uh, scaling that seems to be uh, fairly similar between the uh, small and large uh, topography. So again, a clear indication that uh, you know those things are fractal objects, basically, but uh, uh, somewhat different. So the, the fractal scaling or the scaling of those topographies, uh, the, uh, in other words, the slope of the scaling regime are somewhat different for the two. And again, so how does that affect, affect, uh, affect the residence time, that's really what I was after when we did those experiments. Uh, and this is, you know, on the left side here of the slide, uh, you can see the, again, log concentration versus log time. Uh, and I just put, you know, a quick indication, it's about 15 hours, like I mentioned, we measured it, basically we started the experiment, you know, late afternoon, and then we came back uh, in the morning and stopped it. So this is about 15 hours of data. Uh, and you can clearly see the scaling, you know, all throughout the 15 hours, uh, with no indication of you know tampering even at that time, so um, so we have a clear again fractal residence time or Paolo residence time uh, in those two um, in those two sets. However, again uh, you know those slopes are not very different, but but they are somewhat different. And if you if we compare uh, and and of course there's only uh, two data sets here, but if we compare the small and large versus their um, topographic scaling, we can see sort of a you know, a trend where uh, it seems that, you know, they, they, they tend to follow uh, the topography, meaning the residence time, the slope of the residence time, or the slope of the breakthrough curve tail seem to uh, correlate or mimic uh, the slope of the power uh, spectrum on the top right. So that was really interesting. And uh, so, of course, that could be, uh, I guess, by chance, or that could be a random event. Uh, but if we look uh, the lines now through those uh, breakthrough curves, so you can see those two straight lines, uh, green and pink, these are actually uh, modeled uh, results. So what we did here is we used a particle tracking model, so we modeled the open channel flow and the subsurface flow uh, as a Darcy flow, and we uh, basically used all the hydraulic measurements that we had of the flume, since it's a flume, we know exactly you know everything, basically the flow and flow rate, depth, etc. Uh, and we were able to, from the topography alone, uh, reproduce the residence time that we observed with the rhodamine or with the dye. We were able to reproduce uh, the same results by using a particle tracking. So uh, just with the topographic information, basically, we were able to link those two. So we're pretty confident that, uh, you know, we showed here in that paper, in the GRL 2015 paper, um, that the fractal topography actually induces uh, the scaling of the residence time in that case. Um, now what I'm doing, uh, so I'm going to talk briefly, this is the main results from that project, but I'd like to kind of extend uh, that thought a little bit and reverse the problem, and that's my illustration of reversing the problem, and again, I'm not endorsing that brand, uh, and I'm not being paid to put it here. Um, <laughs> and so the idea here is to uh, start with the scaling of the topography, and then create a topography and then test the residence time. And again, we've all seen, whoops, that didn't work, so how do I do this, excuse me? Yes, this is just another illustration, but we've all seen those uh, sorts of uh, video game kind of landscapes that are all based on basically Fourier transforms and power spectrum. And so the point here is that we can actually create realistic looking topographies simply based on the scaling uh, that we choose. So instead of using the flume and creating a real topography. Now what I'm doing is I'm using the uh, statistics, basically I'm, I'm creating a power spectrum and from that power spectrum I'm creating a landscape and this is a more realistic uh, version of what I actually use. So Anzili is my, uh, one of my PhD students and she's been working on this quite a bit. Uh, but we basically create a fractal landscape just from the uh, power spectrum that we choose. So now we can study different scaling in the power spectrum and look at you know, how the topography looks and how the residence time looks in those things. And this is a, a simple illustration. This is all work in progress, so not, none of this is really final. But just a simple example in 2D where at the top you have the power spectra, so you can see that we can play, basically we can impose whatever we want in that power spectrum, different slopes, different you know, regimes of scaling, so on and so forth, different 
uh, scales. You, we could have like sidebars, you know, that scale one way, and then uh, dunes and ripples that scale another way, so on and so forth. And then from the power spectrum, we can create those topographies that we have you have at the bottom. And again, each of those colors correspond to the color of the power spectrum, so we can you know inverse that, get that topography, uh, and then simply from these topographies, again, this is just a simple 2D example, but uh, we just uh, run the you know groundwater uh, flow model basically. So it's uh, Darcy's law, you know, in the bottom, and then the boundary is really that uh, scaling. So the head distribution at the top is created by the topography, and then we can do um, again particle tracking or modeling to look at residence times under these different uh, topographies that we uh, created in the computer. And then when we do that, again, on the top right here is a reminder of the actual data, so the power spectrum from the flume. And then on the left here is um, some, again, this is obviously just a, a schematic of the results. This, this is not the uh, real results, but it's just a schematic to, to show that we, we actually um, can reproduce this way, or using these artificial topographies now, we can um, um, you know, back calculate uh, residence times and, and look uh, more closely at the correlation between the fractality of the bed and the fractality of the residence times. Um, and then finally, and to conclude on this, um, you know, I titled the talk uh, on water quality, so for each project I try to uh, uh, wrap it with uh, water quality. So what we can also do with the, uh, with the modeling is, you know, under those different topographies, everything else being constant, meaning you know, we have the same kinds of uh, reactions taking place, you know, the effective reaction, we can look at the effective re reaction rate. So meaning that if we, again, this is all modeling, but if we put nitrate uh, in the water, let's say, and we have everything the same except the topography, so except the uh, residence time, what is the amount of nitrate removed? And that's what that shows. So basically, we can correlate the effective reaction rate or the amount of nitrate removed from the water to the topographic uh, scaling. And again, this is what uh, where this work is going. And then finally, last point on this uh, first project before I, um, I talk about that second uh, set of experiments. Uh, the last thing I'd like to do, so now this kind of computational work uh, is you know, underway and, and being done, what I'd like to do next is actually flip the problem yet again, meaning that when we have the 3D topographies on the computer, now uh, technology is good enough that we can actually uh, print porous media, right? And so we could actually use those artificial topographies, print them uh, with a 3D printer to make a real, you know, uh, riverbed or a real flume bed, and then put those back in the flume and verify our uh, or verify verify the modeling results uh, in, you know, a real flume with real water with a uh, with bed forms that were created from the artificial topography from the computer. So I think this is a you know, a cool idea that I'm, I'm hoping to uh, uh, find some funding for. Um, and this is just a, an illustration of a 3D printed structure, if you're wondering, that's just to make it look pretty. Uh, <laughs> and so that's that's the, the wrap on that uh, first project, linking the uh, fractal pattern of the riverbed to the uh, anomalous transport, basically, uh, through that bed. Now the second project I'm going to talk about now, I'm, I'm, I'm switching gear, but you'll see that these, these things, to, to me at least, are very uh, you know, close to each other or related. Uh, and here again, I'm looking at biofilm, uh, biofilm growth uh, and how they influence residence time. So again, here it's, it's a little different uh, from what you may be uh, used to think about when you think about biofilms. So we, usually we think of biofilms as um, reactors, right? So the, there are the bugs that actually use, you know, the, the, the fertilizer, so they're like, you know, they're the reactive part of the transport, if you will. Here I'm actually thinking of them as more of a structure, so I'm doing a little bit of both, but what I'm going to focus on here is really thinking of the biofilms as that new layer of complexity uh, that is around those stones. And so if we look at the top left here, the top left corner, you can see the stream that we used, or one of the streams that we used uh, before and after uh, biofilm growth. So the left side is really the initial condition, if you will, the day one, and I'll show data uh, from that day one with a clean sediment bed, basically no bugs, no nothing. Uh, and then we leave the biofilms grow, <clears throat> grow like throughout the season, and this is a, a picture towards the end. Uh, they actually look kind of senescing here, uh, but you can see how much um, 
you know, how much biofilm growth we got. Uh, and again, I'm thinking of biofilms in terms of structure, so all these other illustrations are just to remind uh, everybody of their, again, complexity or how they're structured. So they're literally like kind of sponges where water, you know, flow through it um, at that micro scale. So they're really adding a layer, again, of like a porous, another layer of porous media that is, of course, much, much smaller than at least the one illustrated here or that we use here. Uh, so the hope was to test whether, you know, this new layer of porous media would impact, um, impact transport. <clears throat> so I'm going to describe the um, experimental setup. So this is uh, Notre Dame uh, Linked Ecosystem Experimental Facility, so LEAF for short. Uh, and I encourage everybody um, interested in, in experimental work to check it out. They, ha they have a website. Uh, it's a really great facility. And this is obviously a sketch, a top view. Uh, the four circles show the four different uh, streams, basically. But uh, So there's like two watersheds. Each watershed has two stream reaches, and there's a, a well, it's not that little, but there's a pond in the middle uh, of each that can be linked or disconnected from the streams. Uh, everything is fed by, uh, you know, that number one on the left here is basically a, a large pond where uh, groundwater is pumped, so it's, it's a groundwater pump, you know, and then that groundwater is stored in that pond and then it's fed by gravity to the watersheds. One of the great things about this facility is that the groundwater is actually very clean, so we have low nutrient water coming in, uh, which in the Midwest, for those of you, you know, uh, living in the mountains like you, but here in the Midwest, we have high, high levels of nutrients, so sometimes that makes uh, field work or experimental work on biogeochemistry uh, challenging, uh, and this facility really has, a, you know, great clean water, so it's really nice to do. Uh, work there. So we use those four streams, four different streams with, uh, and this is kind of the experimental setups, four different um, uh, substrate sizes. So one was coarse, so we call it cobble, but it's really a coarse gravel, uh, mostly. <clears throat> Excuse me, I am searching my slide here. Trying to... Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so yeah, so one stream with coarse gravel, one stream with uh, pea gravel, so small gravel. So the coarse one is about maybe it's three to five centimeter uh, size diameter. The pea gravel is about you know less than a centimeter. And then we had two conditions where both were mixed. So the well mixed one is just 50-50 mixed, you know, all well mixed. And then what we call alternating here, you can see the illustration. We have two meter sections of coarse and two meter section section of fine, if you will. Uh, uh, in alternance. And again, we were trying to test different uh, aspects of complexities and different, uh, you know, mixing patterns, basically, and see how they influence the uh, transport. And what we did is we turned on the, 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 turn on the flow after we um, initially set the, the sediment, and then we looked at the transport, again, of rhodamine, so a dye, and there's a, a few descriptions here, but those streams are really small, so one and a half liters per second uh, about and travel times are five to ten minutes. They're about uh, fifty, well, almost sixty meters long. Uh, so that gives you an idea of, of you know what we're talking about. And this is the day one results that are published also in GRL in a different paper. Um, and so the the day one results again are you know that initial condition without biofilms. So we can clearly see that again log log uh, scaling. So that nice tail but hardly, uh, harshly truncated at some point. Uh, and again, the highlighted blue here just shows uh, the truncation time. So this is the time at which that power low scaling stops. Uh, and, and of course, you can see that the coarse gravel has a shorter time, the fine gravel has the longest time, and then the mix are very similar and sort of in between. And, and this is expected because the coarse gravel, of course, uh, has you know coarser pore, faster flow through the hypoic zone or inside the porous media, so that it flushes faster, basically, than everything else. Uh, so this was really the uh, the original data, um, and again, early truncation for the coarse, late truncation for the fine, and then intermediate for the other two. Uh, but what I want to focus on here is really that um, biofilm growth. So again, images uh, before and after of the fine and the coarse gravel, uh, and then at the bottom here, just a, an illustration of the biomass um, growth over time uh, for the initial period, so that saturation period. Um, and this is all published in JGR now, last year. Um, 
and this is uh, finally the, the punchline here almost uh, where we can see all the streams after 12 weeks so that's you know after the um, after the growth has saturated so the biofilm is installed uh, nicely and again as a reminder the week one data uh, as an inset you can see the harsh truncation and what you can notice after 12 weeks or when the biofilms are present uh, is that there's no more truncation or at least you know, no truncation that we can observe within the about three hours that we let uh, we let the experiments go so the truncation is much later uh, and also the streams I didn't illustrate the four streams for the day one uh, but they look a lot more similar after the biofilm is has grown so there's basically a more homogeneity in the transport pattern once the biofilm uh, has grown. And then, uh, so since we don't have the truncation, what we do here is we use a parallel uh, model, so a parallel slope as, a, as the parameter for, uh, to analyze the data. And then what we observe, and this is a <coughs> really nice uh, figure, is the real correlation basically between the uh, uh, biofilm growth pattern. So this is uh, as Ashri dry mass, so it's basically a, a proxy for uh, the biomass uh, at the bottom of the stream, and then on the, in the blue is the Paolo uh, slope, the slope of that uh, Paolo tail in the transport. And you can clearly see that you know they both seem to uh, follow each other. So you know the, these are sometimes at di uh, different weeks, but again the pattern is very uh, compelling that the biofilm growth actually you know modify the the transport pattern uh, consistently, basically. And this is for all streams together. Uh, and as uh, promised, I said I would look at the reactive transport or water quality, if you will, um, <clears throat> for each of those two projects. So this is um, in prep by uh, Brittany Hanrahan, and that's an illustration of us working in the field a couple years back. Uh, so that gives you also a scale for what those streams look like. Um, and then so she's uh, finalizing a manuscript right now uh, where we looked at uh, reactive transport. So we did... Um, ammonium and phosphorus um, injections and then you know measured uh, uptake basically and you can see here on the left side the, the patterns of basically uptake uh, being correlated or somewhat correlated to uh, trend and storage uh, parameters so again that K1 over K2 it doesn't really matter what it is but uh, it basically is a, a measure of the amount of storage or the amount of retention the water had in those streams uh, and we can see some uh, some correlation between again the uh, amount of uptake uh, and uh, uh, the amount of retention in the stream. So this is something that people have really uh, tried to find, uh, and that's usually not, uh, you know usually difficult to do. So here again, using uh, different model and different techniques, we were able to uh, to show that pattern. So again, the key points for this uh, project is that the substrate size influenced the anomalous transport on day one and on the top right here is the early data for all four streams, so you can see there was different patterns of truncation here. Uh, then finally, the, pal uh, the, the truncated Paolo resistance time distribution described the observed transport without the biofilm, so at the early stages, and that was a nice discovery. I mean, we, we set out to really sh uh, see those truncations, so we were really happy uh, we could. Finally, the Paolo uh, tails, so at the later times when the biofilm is on, uh, the the tails became uh, much more heavier and much more similar uh, between streams uh, than they were at the beginning. So again, the biofilms modify the conservative transport, uh, you know, by adding that layer of, uh, of of complexity. And at the same time, they also sort of homogenize it because they're more similar, you know, uh, uh, between the stream than the than our experimental gravels uh, were. Uh, and then finally, we have evidence that uh, that transient storage or that retention in the stream uh, correlated with uh, the activity of the biofins in those uh, streams. So I'm going to take a few minutes here just to um, uh, talk about a, a little bit of a broader um, aspect or more breadth of my research, so other things I've been doing or I'm doing. Uh, and again, at the top here, I've been involved in those uh, sediment mixing um, experiments at uh, Northwestern by Kevin Roche, and that's recently published in ESNT, and that was looking at how um, uh, worms basically um, mix the top layer of the sediment, and how you know again those anomalous transport models can help us understand those patterns. Uh, the next two papers are by Tomasz Aquino, who was uh, Diego Bolster's uh, PhD student uh, that I collaborate collaborated with, and these are uh, much more theoretical papers, 
Uh, but again, looking at you know tail scaling, you can see in the title there uh, on the first one, and so always kind of looking at that anonymous transport and its behavior. And then this very recently published uh, uh, paper here, noise driven return statistics. So again, that that's kind of to enlarge the, the 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 topic. I said my sandbox, my own personal sandbox, is kind of that stream bottom and what happens there. Uh, but in this paper, we really uh, look at you know processes that aff affect all kinds of uh, issues from you know economics, so social sciences, uh, anything that has basically a storage uh, that is affected by some some sort of uh, shut noise or no, uh, noise boundary, basically noisy boundary. So it's true in hydrological systems. It's also true in you know many different systems. Uh, and then at the bottom here again another. Um, uh, uh, project that I'm involved with with colleagues at uh, Notre Dame mostly um, and Rice um, looking at dispersal of uh, genetically engineered organisms so again dispersal being the keyword for me right so I'm interested in transport and how things uh, uh, how things travel basically uh, a quick plug for the facilities at Purdue before I, I finish. So that's just a, a, a couple pictures of flumes and a tow tank. So that tow tank at the middle left here is really big and being, you know, renovation or still undergoing but almost done. And so this thing is going to be uh, up and running real soon. So we have a nice, you know, hydraulics uh, uh, lab and hydraulics facility. So invite people to uh, check it out uh, if they're interested. We also have nice. Outdoor facilities, so TPAC here is basically an experimental farm that uh, Purdue owns, and you can see those experimental plots on the right side, and this is just a Google image. And then in the middle, that ditch here is also uh, instrumented, so there's uh, um, two different reaches. There's a two-stage ditch where it's basically manipulated, and then we have instrumentation going on, so there's a lot of you know, potential for uh, experimental work at Purdue. And uh, finally, I wrap with uh, you know, reminding or returning to my uh, introduction about uh, again fertilizers in the water or pollution, what we used to consider or we still consider pollution because they are, uh, but also consider them as uh, uh, a potential as a resource. And and so what I'm uh, trying to work on now is more of uh, that recovery uh, idea and how can we at the uh, field scale maybe uh, recover some of those nutrients so they can do work for us basically and then so this way we don't see the depollution as a cost to the farmers let's say but as a potential uh, opportunity and I think there's a lot of uh, you know possibilities there uh, and I think I'll leave it at that and uh, this is just a, a simple slide uh, reminding of uh, a few of the results I gave thank you very much <laughs> All right, thank you, Antoine. Um, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box, and then either I or Doga will read them out loud, and Anton will answer them. As long as I can see them, I will uh, read them out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> okay, I think I have that. Uh, yeah, chat box, but I don't see anything coming in. No yeah, questions from anybody? Really, guys? Oh, that's okay. You just, you just explained coffee. everything so clearly. I know, right? That was the perfect uh, seminar. So one thing <laughs> I tell everybody is that this is my first uh, webinar uh, that I'm giving. I've seen a few, but it's a very strange feeling <laughs> to be talking to an audience uh, that's not here. He's, he's we saying, do have guys, one question. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. I can't see it, so go please read it. Yeah, someone typed in the the question the question into the um, questions box, even though they weren't supposed to. So I will copy and paste it. Sounds good. Yep. So it's for Michelle Newcomer, and the question is: Is there a measuring system for hyper hyperheric? Uh, how do you say that? Gases. <laughs> hyperic hyper gases. Yeah. There we uh, go. <laughs> Okay, so yes, as far as I know, there's a, a few systems. Of course, I can come up with a name, but they have those uh, chambers now that they use um, that let you uh, sample basically hyperic gases. Uh, there's also, um, and I will try to remember the name. Uh, there's also, well, we also use gases obviously for as tracers, right? So. Um, you know, our argon uh, has been used, and uh, radon is used a lot, and then SF6, of, of course, is used. So, 
there's plenty of issues with um, uh, exchange with the atmosphere, obviously, in the surface, but we, we can, uh, those things have really high detection limits, so gases are also used as tracers, but I, I, I'm assuming the question is more about uh, maybe uh, nitrogen uh, degassing from denitrification, for example, and things like that, so we can also just sample, basically, right, um, the hyperic water and then measure it, you know, on a, uh, in the lab, basically, but in, in situ, uh, there's also, like I said, there's, there's those mini chambers now that they came up with where you can actually measure, in, that do in situ measurement in the hyperic zone, and of course I don't remember what they're called, sorry. <laughs> uh, we have another question, Anna Radke. You mentioned using 3D printing to create artificial bed forms. Wouldn't whatever cement is used to hold a shape affect water flow significantly? Uh, okay, so... Sure, but I mean, so what I'm what I'm suggesting is that this is not very different from a packed, you know, um, uh, porous media, right? So if you have, say, sand grains or even that pea gravel, right? Those those grains touch somewhere, and that's why they hold, right? They're not floating in the matrix. So you know, there's places where they touch, and there's places where there's a pore, throat, and so on and so forth. So what I'm saying is. Nowadays, with the technology available, we can actually print uh, with, in, indeed, with like cements, literally like um, you know, uh, powdered uh, stones. We can, or ceramic, I guess you would call them. Uh, so we can actually print at, at millimeter scale or even some millimeter scale, but let's say millimeter scale structures. So ba basically, you would have, you know, the only limit is really the size of the pixel you can use. And nowadays, those things are small enough that you could. You know, you so you couldn't print, say, a clay, you know, or something really, really small, but definitely, uh, you know, small gravels. I think we could uh, print no problem and without uh, much different difference from you know a regular porous media, basically. All right, um, we have another question. I'll paste it in. Audrey Sawyer asks. What do you think are the spatial scales of dead zones that contribute to more tailing with biofilm? Is it dead zones at the scale of whole stringers in the water column, cell, cell scale, roughness, et cetera? Uh, that's a great question. Hi, Audrey. Uh, <laughs> um, well, the short answer is I don't know, right? So because we didn't really measure um, uh, the retention in the biofilm. So I can answer an anecdotically that you could actually see it, right? So when we put the rhodamine in the stream and, you know, just watch it go, you can see that retention within the biofilm, so you can literally see that pink, you know, kind of hang out uh, there like you would, you know, in exactly in a dead zone, like in a side pool or something. So you could, you know, visually see it through the biofilm. Now, which, um, you know, in so, so I, I, the other thing is we had one stream in particular that had a lot of stringers, and you could probably see that quickly on one of the slides in the pea gravel. And the other ones, not so much. They were more like encrusted biofilms, so they were quite different um, shapes, actually, from stream to stream. Uh, and yet, you know, the transport was very similar. So I would, you know, I would venture to say it's probably, again, the kind of the, not the cellular scale, but kind of the matrix, like inside, you know, the, 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 yeah, the matrix of the biofilm itself that really is doing that retention rather than those long stringer just kind of increasing dispersion type of things. But again, this is kind of, you know, I'm just guessing here because I didn't measure those things. All right, next question is from Joda Speronis. Hi, Anton. Sorry I missed the beginning, but when you talk about reaction, do you mean only adsorption to stream bed loads or other types of reactions too? Also, how do you control for variations in suspended load and how it may affect your results? Okay, um, so actually when I, well, in, in this specific case, when I'm talking of reactive transport, I, I mean basically anything that is reactive, so that can be absorption or uh, uptake, but in this case, I mean, I, I focus mostly on fertilizer, so I'm thinking more about um, uptake, basically, like how biofilms uh, use nutrients for growth, basically, right, for uh, metabolism. So, so I'm really thinking more of uh, biogeochemical reactions in general, but more specifically, typically, uh, about uptake rather than sorption. However, I have, you know, I, uh, I have a freshwater science paper where I looked at sorption quite a bit in the modeling side, 
uh, as far as the bed load, I, uh, so in this case, again, in the specific experiments I showed today, uh, I didn't have that uh, problem or that issue because, so for the flume experiments, we actually used a subcritical flow when we did the uh, release experiment from the bed. Uh, and for the leaf experiment, so that second set of experiments with the gravels, again, they were gravel and a very low flow, so we didn't have any entrainment as well. So, so we, we didn't, you know, uh, think about uh, bed load or uh, suspended load. All right, next question is from Anderson Ward. A number of studies have used laser-based distributed temperature to monitor hyperaric exchange. Would temperature be useful as a tracer, and would it be amenable to these types of analyses? Uh, yes, so again, that's something I've been thinking of using. I haven't actually used it yet. Um, there's a, well, there's a number of things. So temperature is great uh, because we can measure it, you know, uh, cheaply and efficiently. However, um, it tends to disappear uh, fast, so yeah. So there's also issues with it, like any tracer, basically. Um, uh, but but uh, certainly, I mean, temperature is you know readily available, and indeed, I mean, it's great for the exchange part of things because you know typically your groundwater and surface water have two different signatures, so they're like two end members of a mixing model type of thing. So it's really nice uh, to use them, and actually, people have started to use those uh, IR cameras now. Uh, where you can actually uh, drone fly, you know, those cameras on your stream, and of course it's only the skin temperature, so it's kind of the surface temperature. But for shallow uh, uh, waters, you can actually see the plume of uh, groundwater coming into the stream. So these are actually super nice. Uh, so there's definitely potential there <clears throat> um, to measure exchange that way for sure. Yep. Any more questions? No more questions? All right. Um, so I guess, well, oh, one more question from Kevin Roach. It's a long one. So let me copy and paste that for you. <laughs> I feel like we're among friends. It's good. I, I know most of the people here. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's a, it's a long one. So Antoine, for your particle tracking model of the first study, have you generated any results where you match the flow to the base flow conditions that generated the large bed forms? I ex expect that this would increase the slope of the residence time power spectrum. It would be exciting to know if two different discharges with two different bed form spectral densities converge to the same residence time power spectrum. Man, I have to read these things three times at least to understand yeah. what <laughs> the question is. Uh, slope of residence time. Uh, okay, I think, oh yeah, okay, so now I get it. Uh, I don't remember doing this. I remember uh, thinking, so, yeah, what Kevin says is basically if I match the discharge from the discharge that we created the bed forms with, because as I said, we reduce the discharge to be at um, below subcritical flow basically so we wouldn't move we wouldn't affect the bed forms we were trying to freeze them so the discharge in the when we actually were doing the residence time experiments the rhodamine injections uh, was not um, the same as the one we used to create the bed forms and basically Kevin is asking I think that if I you know in the modeling since I was able to match the residence time with the modeling can I you know, change the discharge basically and see if they converge for the natural discharge. Uh, and that's a great thought. So I remember thinking of doing this or something similar or basically just, you know, increasing discharge and see how that would affect um, the residence time uh, given the bed form, which is kind of what I'm still doing with those new results that I showed. Uh, but, I mean, to in answer briefly, the answer is no, I didn't really match them or I don't remember uh, matching them. I, I remember thinking of more like varying the discharge basically to see how that would affect uh, residence time more than uh, just using the natural flow that formed the bed forms, if that makes any sense. <laughs> All right, any more questions? Give another minute or so for more questions. While we're waiting, I just want to point out that we have two more speakers for the Cyber Seminar Series uh, next week. 
Friday, April 7th, we have Felipe de Barros from the University of Southern California. He'll be speaking on solid transport and heterogeneous aquifers and implications for risk assessment. And then on April 14th, Pietro de Ana um, will be speaking on biological and chemical activities and confined flows, the role of heterogeneity and segregation. They all take place at 3 o'clock Eastern Time, and you must register before each webinar to attend. It looks like there are no more questions, so I'll right. go ahead. Um, you know, uh, there are two deadlines for Quasi. Um, so tomorrow is a deadline for our Instrumentation Discovery Travel Grant program. Um, it's a simple two-pager that you'll send, and you get up to $1,000 to cover your travel costs um, anywhere uh, to learn new instrumentation from different colleagues. So um, go ahead and apply if you if you want to. And then our next deadline is uh, for our conference on hydroinformatics, submitting data without drowning in deluge. Uh, the deadline for that is April 15th. And as you can see, there are the different oral and poster presentations that we're looking for. So, all right. Um, Giogo, Antoine, anything else? No. no just thank, thank you. And please uh, attend the next couple of conferences where we will move from surface waters to subsurface environments. All right. Well, thank you, Antoine. Uh, thank you, Diogo, yeah, and ever. All right, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Good weekend. All righty. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.